Contraception. Contraception is any method that prevents conception or childbirth, including oral contraceptives, sterilization of the female, and the male condom, which are the most popular methods in the United States. There are also many additional types of contraceptives discussed here. In the United States, there are approximately 68 million women in their childbearing years between the ages of 15 and 44, and throughout those years, a variety of contraceptive methods may be used. Studies have shown that 98% of sexually active women in the United States admit to having used at least one form of contraception. However, despite widespread use of contraceptives, almost one-half of all pregnancies in the United States are unintended, accounting for a higher unintended pregnancy rate than in other Western countries. In addition to unwanted pregnancies, some contraceptives also help to prevent transmission of STDs and HIV. Fifteen people in the United States become infected with HIV every minute of every day. Much of this suffering could be prevented by access to and consistent use of safe, efficient, appropriate modern contraception for everyone who wants it, as well as proper education regarding benefits and instructions for use. Contraceptive methods can be divided into four basic types, behavioral methods, barrier methods, hormonal methods, and permanent methods. Women must decide which method is appropriate for them to meet their changing contraceptive needs throughout their life cycles. Nurses can educate and assist women during the selection process. In an era where many women wish to delay pregnancy and to avoid STIs, choices can become difficult. There are numerous methods of contraception available today, and many more will be offered in the near future. The ideal contraceptive method for many women would have to have the following characteristics. Ease of use, safety, effectiveness, minimal side effects, naturalness, non-hormonal methods, and immediate reversibility. Currently, no single contraceptive method offers all of these things. Abstinence, which is not having vaginal or anal intercourse, is one of the least expensive forms of contraception and has been used for thousands of years. Basically, pregnancy cannot occur if sperm is kept out of the vagina. It also reduces the risk of contracting HIV or AIDS and other STIs unless bodily fluids are exchanged through oral sex. However, some infections such as herpes and human papillomavirus or vaginal warts can be passed by skin-to-skin -skin contact. There are many pleasurable options for sex play without intercourse, called outercourse, such as kissing, mutual masturbation, erotic massage, sexual fantasy, and using sex toys or safe oral sex. Many people have strong feelings about abstinence based on religious or moral beliefs. There are many good and personal reasons to choose abstinence. For some, it is a way of life, whereas for others, it is a temporary choice. Some people choose abstinence because they want to wait until they are older, wait for a long-term relationship, avoid pregnancy or STIs, or follow religious or cultural expectations. Fertility awareness refers to any natural contraceptive method that does not require hormones, pharmaceutical compounds, physical barriers, or surgery to prevent pregnancy. Fertility awareness-based methods use physical signs and symptoms that change with the hormonal fluctuations that occur throughout a woman's menstrual cycle to prevent fertility. The unifying theme of fertility awareness methods is that a woman can reduce her chance of pregnancy by abstaining from coitus or using barrier methods during certain times of the menstrual cycle. These methods require couples to take an active role in preventing pregnancy through their sexual behaviors. Couples agree to practice certain techniques, use calculations, and be observant of the fertile and safe periods within the monthly menstrual cycle. The normal physiological changes caused by hormonal fluctuations during the menstrual cycle can be observed and charted. This information can then be used to avoid or promote pregnancy. Fertility awareness methods rely on the following assumptions. First, 
that a single ovum is released from the ovary 14 days before the next menstrual period, and it lives for approximately 24 hours. Two, sperm can live up to five days after intercourse. The unsafe period during the menstrual cycle is thus approximately six days, three days before and three days after ovulation. Because body changes start to occur before ovulation, the woman can become aware of them and not have intercourse on these days or use another method to prevent pregnancy. The exact time of ovulation cannot be determined, so two to three days are added to the beginning to avoid pregnancy. Techniques used to determine fertility include cervical mucus ovulation method, the basal body temperature method, the symptothermal method, standard days method, and the two-day method. Fertility awareness methods are moderately effective, but are very unforgiving if not carried out precisely. Fertility awareness can be used in combination with coital abstinence or barrier methods during fertile days if pregnancy is not desired. The cervical mucus ovulation method is used to assess the characteristics of the cervical mucus. Cervical mucus changes in consistency during the menstrual cycle and plays a vital role in the fertilization of the egg. Studies conducted by the World Health Organization indicate that 93% of women, regardless of their educational level, are capable of identifying and distinguishing fertile and infertile cervical secretions. In the days preceding ovulation, fertile cervical mucus helps draw sperm up into the fallopian tubes, where fertilization usually takes place. It also helps maintain the survival of sperm. As ovulation approaches, the mucus becomes more abundant, clear, slippery, and smooth. It can be stretched between two fingers without breaking. Under the influence of estrogen, this mucus looks like egg whites. It is called spinbarket mucus. After ovulation, the cervical mucus becomes thick and dry under the influence of progesterone. The cervical position can also be assessed to confirm the changes in cervical mucus at ovulation. Near ovulation, the cervix feels soft and high up or deep in the vagina. The os is slightly open and the cervical mucus is copious and slippery. This method works because the woman becomes aware of the bodily changes that accompany her ovulation. When she notices them, she can abstain from sexual intercourse or use another method to prevent unwanted pregnancy. Each woman is an individual, so each woman's unsafe time of the month is unique and thus must be individually assessed and determined. The Basal Body Temperature Method The basal body temperature, or BBT, refers to the lowest temperature reached upon awakening. The woman takes her temperature orally before rising and records it on a chart. Pre-ovulation temperatures are suppressed by estrogen, whereas post-ovulation temperatures are increased under the influence of heat-inducing progesterone. Temperatures typically rise within a day or two after ovulation and remain elevated for approximately two weeks, at which point bleeding usually begins. If using this method by itself, the woman should avoid unprotected intercourse until the basal body temperature has been elevated for three days. Other fertility awareness methods should be used along with the basal body temperature method for better results. The symptothermal method relies on a combination of techniques to recognize ovulation, including basal body temperature, cervical mucus changes, alterations in the position and firmness of the cervix, and other symptoms of ovulation, including increased libido, mitral smirk, pelvic fullness or tenderness, and breast tenderness. Combining all these predictors increases awareness of when ovulation occurs and increases effectiveness of this method. A home predictor test for ovulation is also available in most pharmacies. These tests measure LH levels to pinpoint the day before or the day of ovulation. These tests are widely used for fertility and infertility regimens. The standard days method and the two-day methods are both natural methods of contraception developed by Georgetown University's Medical Center Institute of Reproductive Health. Both methods provide women with simple, clear instructions for identifying fertile days. Women with menstrual cycles between 26 and 32 days long can use this method to prevent pregnancy by avoiding unprotected intercourse on days 8 through 19 of their cycles.
An international clinical trial of the standard DACE method showed that the method is more than 95% effective when used correctly. The standard DACE method identifies the 12-day fertility window of a woman's menstrual cycle. These 12 days take into account the lifespan of a woman's egg, which is about 24 hours, as well as the viability of the sperm, which is about 5 days, and the variation in the actual timing of ovulation from one cycle to another. For the 2-day method, women observe the presence or absence of cervical secretions by examining toilet paper or underwear, or by monitoring their physical sensations. Every day, the woman asks two simple questions. Did they note any secretions yesterday? And did they note any secretions today? If the answer to either question is yes, she considers herself fertile and avoids unprotected intercourse. If the answers are no, she is unlikely to become pregnant from unprotected intercourse on that day. To help women keep track of the days on which they should avoid unprotected intercourse, a string of 32 colored beads called cycle beads are used. Each bead represents a day of the menstrual cycle. Starting with the red bead, which represents the first day of her menstrual cycle, the woman moves a small rubber ring, one bead each day. The brown beads are the days in which pregnancy is unlikely, and the white beads represent fertile days. There is also the withdrawal or coitus interruptus method. In coitus interruptus, also known as the withdrawal method, a man controls his ejaculation during sexual intercourse and ejaculates outside of the vagina. It is better known colloquially as pulling out. It is one of the oldest and most widely used means of preventing pregnancy in the world. The problem with this method is that the first few drops of true ejaculate contain the greatest concentration of sperm, and if some pre-ejaculatory fluid does escape from the urethra before orgasm, conception may still occur. This method requires that the woman rely solely on the cooperation and judgment of the man. There is also the lactational amenorrhea method. The lactational amenorrhea method, or LAM, is an effective temporary method of contraception used by breastfeeding mothers. Continuous breastfeeding can postpone ovulation and thus prevent pregnancy. Breastfeeding stimulates the hormone prolactin, which is necessary for milk production. It also inhibits the release of another hormone called gonadotropin, which is necessary for ovulation. Breastfeeding as a contraceptive method can be effective for six months after delivery. Only if a woman has not had a period since she gave birth, breastfeeds her baby at least six times a day on both breasts, breastfeeds her baby on demand at least every four hours, does not substitute other foods for breast milk, provides nighttime feedings at least every six hours, and does not rely on this method after six months of time. There are also many barrier contraceptive methods. Barrier contraceptives are forms of birth control that prevent pregnancy by preventing the sperm from reaching the ovum. Mechanical barriers include condoms, diaphragms, cervical caps, and sponges. These devices are placed over the penis or over the cervix to physically obstruct the passage of the sperm into the cervix. Chemical barriers, called spermicides, may also be used along with mechanical barrier devices. Spermicides come in creams, jellies, foams, suppositories, and vaginal films. Spermicides work by chemically destroying the sperm in the vagina. These contraceptives are called barrier methods because they not only provide a physical barrier for the sperm, but also protect against STIs. Many of these barrier methods contain latex. Allergy to latex was first recognized in the late 1970s, and since, it has become a major health concern with increasing numbers of people affected. According to the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, 6% of the general population, 10% of healthcare workers, and 50% of spina bifida patients are sensitive to natural rubber latex. Healthcare workers in both the medical and dental environments, as well as specific groups of individuals, including those with spina bifida, myelodysplasia, and food allergies, to banana, kiwi, avocado, and others are at risk of latex sensitivity. The symptoms of latex allergy include skin rash, itching, and hives, itching or burning eyes, swollen mucous membranes in the genitals, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing or wheezing, and anaphylactic shock. 
use of or contact with a latex condom, cervical cap, or diaphragm is contraindicated for men and women with a latex allergy. If the female partner is allergic to latex, have the male partner apply a natural condom over the latex one. If the male partner experiences penile irritation after condom use, try different brands or place the latex condom over a natural condom. You may also use polyurethane condoms rather than latex ones or use female condoms made of polyurethane. Alternatively, you could switch to another birth control method that isn't made with latex, such as oral contraceptives, intrauterine devices, Depo-Provera, fertility awareness, and other non-barrier methods. However, these methods do not protect against sexually transmitted infections. Condoms. Condoms are barrier methods of contraceptives made for both males and females. The male condom is made from latex or polyurethane or a natural membrane and may be coated with a spermicidal agent. Male condoms are available in many colors, textures, sizes, shapes, and thicknesses. When used correctly, the male condom is put over an erect penis before it enters the vagina and is worn throughout the duration of sexual intercourse. Condoms serve as a barrier to prevent pregnancy by trapping seminal fluid and sperm and offers protection against sexually transmitted infections. Condoms are not perfect barriers, however. Breakage and slippage can occur. Emergency postcoital contraception may be needed to prevent a pregnancy in the case of a breakage or slippage. In addition, the non-latex condoms have a higher risk of pregnancy and higher risk of STIs than latex condoms. The female condom is a polyurethane pouch which is inserted into the vagina. It consists of an outer and inner ring that is inserted vaginally and held in place by the pubic bone. Some women complain that the female condom is cumbersome to use and makes noise during intercourse. Female condoms are readily available, are inexpensive, and can be carried inconspicuously by the woman. The female condom was the first woman-controlled method that offered protection against pregnancy and some STIs. Nurses can play a key role in influencing clients to initiate and maintain the use of female condoms, which is an underused method for STI prevention and prevention of unwanted pregnancy in the United States. The diaphragm. The diaphragm is a soft latex dome surrounded by a metal spring. Used in conjunction with a spermicidal cream or jelly, this diaphragm is inserted into the vagina to cover the cervix. The diaphragm may be inserted up to four hours before intercourse, but must be left in place for at least six hours after intercourse. Diaphragms are available in a range of sizes and styles. The diaphragm is available only by prescription and must be professionally fitted by a healthcare professional. Women may need to be refitted with different sizes of diaphragms after pregnancy, abdominal or pelvic surgery, or weight loss or gain of more than 10 pounds. As a rule, diaphragms should be replaced every one to two years. Cervical caps. The cervical cap is smaller than the diaphragm and covers only the cervix. It is held in place by suction. Caps are made from silicone or latex and are used with spermicidal agents. The printive cap and the fem cap are the only cervical cap devices that are approved in the United States as of 2011. The cap may be inserted up to 12 hours before intercourse and provides 48 hours of protection. The cap must be kept in the vagina eight hours after the final act of intercourse and should be replaced every one to two years. A refitting may also be necessary when the woman experiences pregnancy, abortion, or weight changes. The dome of the cap is filled about one-third full with a spermicidal agent. Spermicide should not be applied to the rim because it may interfere with the seal that must form around the cervix. The cap is only available by prescription and must be fitted by a healthcare professional. Contraceptive sponges. The contraceptive sponge is a non-hormonal, non-prescription device that includes both a barrier and a spermicide. The contraceptive sponge is a soft, concave device that prevents pregnancy by covering the cervix and releasing spermicide. The sponge, made of polyurethane, impregnated with a spermicidal agent called nonoxidal 9, releases 125 milligrams of the spermicide over 24 hours of use. Unlike the diaphragm, the sponge can be used for more than one coital act within 24 hours without the insertion of additional spermicidal agents. And the sponge does not require a fitting or a prescription from a healthcare provider.
While the sponge is less effective than several other methods, it does not offer protection against STIs. However, the sponge has achieved a wide following among women who appreciate the spontaneity with which it can be used and its ease of availability. To use the sponge, the woman first wets it with water and then inserts it into the vagina with a finger using a cord loop attachment. It can be inserted up to 24 hours before intercourse and should be left in place at least six hours following intercourse. The sponge provides protection for up to 12 hours, but should not be left in place for more than 30 hours after insertion to avoid the risk of toxic shock syndrome. The sponge is a contraceptive method, but it does not protect against sexually transmitted diseases or infections. There are also several hormonal methods available to women who want a long-term but not permanent protection against pregnancy. These methods of contraception work by altering the hormones within the woman's body. These hormonal methods rely on estrogen and progestin, or progesterone alone, to prevent ovulation. When used consistently, these methods are the most reliable way to prevent pregnancy. Hormonal methods include oral contraceptives, injectables, implants, vaginal rings, and transdermal patches. As early as 1937, scientists recognized that the injection of progesterone inhibited ovulation in rabbits and provided contraception. Breakthrough bleeding was reported in early clinical trials in women, and the role of estrogen in the cycle control was launched. This established the rationale for a modern combination oral contraceptives that contain both estrogen and progesterone. Development of hormonal contraception marked a revolutionary step in social change that was to improve the lives of women and families worldwide. Since the first oral contraceptive was introduced in the 1960s, hormonal contraception has undergone various stages of advancement. Today, oral contraceptive regimens are safer and more tolerable with equal or improved efficacy than the early formulations. In 1960, the FDA approved the first combination oral contraceptive called Inovoid 10 which composed of 150 micrograms of estrogen and 9 milligrams of progesterone for use in the United States. Today, nearly 30 combination oral contraceptives are available in the United States. The most notable change over the last 50 years oral contraceptive improvement has been the lowering of the estrogen dose to as low as 20 micrograms and the introduction of new progestins. Oral contraceptives are the most popular method of non-surgical contraception and are used approximately by 25 million women in the U.S. Unlike the original oral contraceptives that women took decades ago, the new low-dose forms carry fewer health risks. Although most commonly prescribed for contraception, oral contraceptives have long been used for the management of a wide range of conditions and actually has many health benefits such as reduce incidence of ovarian and endometrial cancer, prevention and treatment of endometriosis, decreased incidence of acne and hirsutism, decreased incidence of ectopic pregnancy, decreased incidence of pelvic inflammatory disease, reduced incidence of fibrocystic breast disease, and decreased perimenopausal symptoms, including rejection in the risk of the development of uterine fibroids, the maintenance of bone and mineral density, and possible protection against pelvic inflammatory disease. Also, there is an increase in menstrual regularity and a lower incidence of colorectal cancer. There is also a decrease in pregnancy-related deaths by preventing pregnancy and reducing iron deficiency anemia by treating menorrhagia and reduced incidence of dysmenorrhea. Oral contraceptives work by suppressing ovulation by adding estrogen and progesterone to a woman's body, thus mimicking pregnancy. This hormonal level stifles gonadotropin-releasing hormone, or GNRH, which in turn suppresses follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH, and luteinizing hormone, or LH, and thus inhibits ovulation. Cervical mucus also thickens, which hinders sperm transport into the uterus. Implantation is inhibited by suppression of the maturation of the endometrium and alterations of uterine secretions. The combination pills are prescribed as monophasic pills, which deliver a fixed dosage of estrogen and progestin, or as multiphasic ones. Multiphasic pills, including biphasic and triphasic oral contraceptives, 
alter the amount of progestin and estrogen within each cycle. Oral contraceptives should be taken at the same time every day. Oral contraceptives that contain progestin only are called mini pills, and they are prescribed for women who cannot take estrogen. They work primarily by thickening the cervical mucus to prevent the penetration of the sperm and to make the endometrium unfavorable for implantation. Progestin-only pills must be taken at a certain time every 24 hours. Breakthrough bleeding and a higher risk of pregnancy have made these mini pills less popular than the combination pills. Extended oral contraceptive regimens have been used for the management of menstrual disorders and endometriosis for years, but now are attracting wider attention. Surveys asking women about their willingness to reduce their menstrual cycles from 12 to 4 annually were returned with a resounding yes. Research has confirmed that the extended use of active oral contraceptive pills carries the same safety profile as the conventional 28-day regimens. The extended regimen consists of 84 consecutive days of active combination pills, followed by seven days of placebo. The woman has four withdrawal bleeding episodes a year. Seasonal and Seasonique are combination oral contraceptives, which are on the market for those women who choose to reduce the number of periods they have. In 2009, the makers of Seasonique came out with Low Seasonique. Low Seasonique consists of 84 orange tablets containing 0.1 milligrams of levonogestrel and 0.02 milligrams of ethanol estradiol along with seven yellow tablets containing 0.01 milligrams ethanol estradiol. The balance between the benefits and risks of oral contraceptives must be determined for each individual woman. Oral contraceptives are highly effective when taken properly, but they can aggravate many medical conditions, especially in women who smoke. Injectable contraceptives. Depra Provera is a trade name for an injectable form of a progesterone-only contraceptive given every 12 weeks. Depra Provera works by suppressing ovulation and the production of FSH and LH by the pituitary gland, thereby increasing the viscosity of the cervical mucus and causing atrophy of the endometrial lining. A single injection of 150 mg acts like other progestin-only products to prevent pregnancy for three months at a time. The primary side effect of Depra Provera is menstrual cycle disturbances. Transdermal patches. A transdermal patch, such as OrthoEvra, is also available. OrthoEvra is a matchbox-sized patch containing hormones that are absorbed through the skin when placed on the lower abdomen, upper outer arm, buttocks, or upper torso, avoiding the breasts. The patch is applied weekly for three weeks, followed by a patch-free week during which withdrawal bleeding occurs. The patch delivers continuous levels of progesterone and estrogen. Transdermal absorption allows the drug to enter the bloodstream directly, avoiding rapid inactivation in the liver, known as first-pass metabolism. Because estrogen and progesterone are metabolized by liver enzymes, avoiding such first-pass metabolism was thought to reduce adverse side effects. However, recent evidence suggests that the risk of venous thrombosis and embolism is increased with the patch, and the risk of skin burns may occur if undergoing an MRI. Additional studies are underway to understand the clinical significance of the latest findings, but in the interim, nurses need to focus on the ongoing risks and assessment to discuss current research findings with clients. Compliance with combination contraceptive patches has been shown to be significantly greater than compliance with oral contraceptives. The patch provides combination hormone therapy with a side effect profile that is similar to oral contraceptives. Vaginal rings. The contraceptive vaginal ring is a soft, flexible, transparent ring that is inserted by the user for a three-week period of continuous use followed by a ring-free week, allowing for withdrawal bleeding to occur. Ethanol estradiol and etonogestrel are rapidly absorbed through the vaginal epithelium and result in a steady stream of serum concentration. Studies have demonstrated that the efficacy and safety of the ring are equivalent to those of oral contraceptives. Clients report being highly satisfied with the vaginal ring and report fewer systemic side effects. The ring provides effective cycle control as well as symptom relief for women with menorrhagia, dysmenorrhea, and polycystic ovarian syndrome. 
The ring can be inserted by the woman and does not have to be fitted. The woman can compress the ring and it inserts into the vagina behind the pubic bone as far back as possible, but precision placement is not critical. The hormones are absorbed through the vaginal mucosa and left in place for three weeks after which it is removed and discarded. Effectiveness and adverse events are similar to those as seen with combination oral contraceptives. The implant is a subdermal time-release method that delivers synthetic progestin, which inhibits ovulation. Once in place, it delivers three years of continuous, highly effective contraception. Like progestin-only pills, implants act by inhibiting ovulation and thickening cervical mucus so that the sperm cannot penetrate. A single rod progestin implant received FDA approval in 2006 and as of 2011 was the only available implant in the United States. Since then, several more have come into being. Hormonal side effects are not exclusive to implants, but tend to be a problem with all hormonal contraceptives. Pre-insertion counseling by a nurse is essential to prepare the woman for any such side effects. Expert counseling should cover the side effects that are most likely to cause discontinuation, including initial irregular bleeding and possibility of amenorrhea with longer use. Intrauterine contraceptives. An intrauterine contraceptive is a small plastic T-shaped object which is placed inside the uterus to provide contraception. It prevents pregnancy by making the endometrium of the uterus hostile to implantation of a fertilized ovum by causing a nonspecific inflammatory reaction and inhibiting the sperm and ovum from meeting. The hormonal IUC, or intrauterine contraceptive, will make monthly periods lighter, shorter, and less painful making this a useful method for women with heavy painful periods. Some implants may contain copper or progesterone to enhance their effectiveness. One or two attached strings protrude into the vagina so that the user can check for placement. Emergency contraception. Unplanned pregnancy is a major health, economic, and social issue for women. Approximately one-third of all unplanned pregnancies end in abortion. Using an emergency contraceptive is a woman's last chance to prevent an unintended pregnancy. Emergency contraceptive, also known as EC, reduces the risk of pregnancy after unprotected intercourse or contraceptive failure, such as a condom breakage. Emergency contraception is used within 72 hours of unprotected intercourse to prevent pregnancy. The sooner the ECs are taken, the more effective they are. They reduce the risk of pregnancy for a single act of unprotected sex by almost 80%. The methods available in the United States are progestin-only pills, Plan B, Plan B one-step, combined estrogen and progesterone pills, or insertion of a copper-releasing intrauterine system up to seven days after unprotected intercourse. Olipristal acetate, marketed as Ella, is a selected progesterone receptor modulator that when taken as a single 30 milligram dose is a new, safe, and effective emergency contraceptive that can be used from the first day up to five days following unprotected intercourse. The older progesterone-only emergency contraceptives, such as levonorgestrel, is taken as two 0.75 milligram pills 12 hours apart or a single 1.5 milligram pill, as in the brand Next Choice, or as a single 1.5 milligram pill, as in the brand Plan B One Step. These are approved for only 72 hours after unprotected intercourse. Sterilization. Sterilization is an attractive method of contraception for those who are certain that they do not want to have any or any more children. Sterilization refers to surgical procedures intended to render a person infertile. Sterilization is a safe and effective form of permanent birth control. In the United States, it is the second most commonly used form of contraception overall, and it is the most frequently used method among married women and among women over 30 years of age. More women than men undergo surgical sterilization. According to the CDC, approximately 18% of women undergo female sterilization in comparison to only 7% of men in the United States. Sterilization should be considered a permanent end to fertility because reversal surgery is difficult, expensive, and not highly successful. Tubal ligation. Tubal ligation is the sterilization procedure for women and can be performed postpartum 
after an abortion or as an interval procedure unrelated to pregnancy. A laparoscope is inserted through a small sub-umbilical incision to provide a view of the fallopian tubes. The fallopian tubes are then grasped and sealed with a cauterizing instrument or with rings, bands, or clips or are cut and tied. This procedure is called transcervical sterilization and offers several advantages over the conventional tubal ligation methods. For example, general anesthesia and incisions are not needed thereby increasing safety, lowering costs, and improving access to sterilization procedures. Vasectomy. Male sterilization is accomplished with a surgical procedure known as a vasectomy. It is usually performed under local anesthesia in the urologist's office, and most men can return to work and normal activities in a day or two. The procedure involves making a small incision into the scrotum and cutting the vas deferens, which carries the sperm from the testes to the penis. Complications from vasectomy are rare and minor in nature. Immediate risks include infection, hematoma, and pain. After a vasectomy, semen no longer contains the sperm. This is not immediately, however, and the man must submit semen specimens for analysis until two specimens show that no sperm is present. When the specimen shows a lack of sperm, the man's sterility is then confirmed. One's contraceptive method is a very personal choice and involves many factors. What makes one woman choose one contraceptive method over another? In making contraceptive choices, couples must balance their sex lives, reproductive goals, and partner's health and safety. The search for the choice that satisfies all three of these objectives may be challenging. A method that works for a sexually active teenage girl may not meet her needs later in life. Several considerations influence a person's choice of contraceptives, including cultural and religious beliefs, motivation, future reproductive plans, and cost. In addition, factors such as convenience, effectiveness, side effects, desire for children in the future, safety of the method, comfort level with sexuality, protection from STIs, and interference with spontaneity may play a role. If a contraceptive is to be effective, the woman must understand how it works, must be able to use it correctly and consistently, and must be comfortable and confident with it. If a client cannot comply with taking a pill daily, they should consider a method used once a week, such as a transdermal patch, or once every three weeks, such as a transvaginal ring, or even once every three months with an injection such as Dipropovera. Another option may be a progesterone intrauterine device that lasts three to five years and reduces menstrual flow significantly. Regardless of which method is chosen, the client's needs should be paramount in the discussion. Nurses can educate clients about which methods are available and their advantages, disadvantages, efficacy, costs, and safety. Counseling can help a woman choose contraceptive methods that are efficacious and fits her preference and lifestyle. Thank you for watching.